said, we're going to lock people up. Who knows what habeas corpus is? How long have we had it? The Magna Carta. Centuries, eight centuries. Bush and Cheney said, I don't need that anymore. We're going to lock people up without charge, without trial, without due process, without notification. We're just going to lock them up, hold them for life. This is why people in Guantanamo refuse to eat and have to be force-fed because they are hopeless. They are innocent. They're known to be innocent. They're known to have confessed under torture. And they're simply locked up and held permanently. No hope. Right? I thought we were, we were all about hope. And so we get a new president who comes in and says, I'm going to give a speech at the National Archives in front of the U.S. Constitution. And he does, and he says, no more habeas corpus. But he makes it sound like, I'm going to defend your rights. That couldn't be done by one administration alone. But when two administrations do it, it starts to acquire an aura of legality. We still do rendition. We still maintain the power of a president to torture. Leon Panetta, who runs the CIA now, David Axelrod, presidential advisor, have both made very clear that the president has the power to torture, just choosing not to use it, at least right now. So you take a crime and you make it a policy choice. Then you choose not to use it for the moment. Right? And if everybody elects Democrats, then there won't be any torture. But if you elect Republicans, then they might start torturing again. That's not a rule of law, right? It's a choice of dictators. So there are a lot of laws that we have to undo, a lot of laws that we have to put in place, a lot of amendments we have to make to the Constitution, and a lot of stuff that I go through in my book. But if we don't start enforcing some of our laws, what the hell's the point? And we don't need to enforce laws because we didn't like Bush or Cheney, or we want revenge. Right? Revenge is the sick way of thinking that let them start these wars in the first place. It's the reason we have things like the death penalty. But we need to enforce laws to deter the continuation and repetition of the crimes. Right? Well, no, we gotta look forward, we gotta look forward. Has anyone ever seen somebody prosecute a crime looking forward outside of a Tom Cruise movie where you see future crimes and you go prosecute them in the future? It can't be done. Every crime is looking backwards. Every single crime. Right? And when, when I get pulled over, I can't say, officer, is this a time for reconciliation? Do you want to hurt the morale of speeders? You know, I can't, I can't talk utter nonsense. But they put it on TV 10,000 times and it ceases to be nonsense. Well, we have to prosecute. In Italy, they are very close to convicting two dozen CIA agents. Our employees who went to kidnap the guy in Italy and sent him off to be tortured. They've had the trial. They're about to, to convict them. In Spain, they are still likely to indict six of our top Bush Cheney officials, lawyers. Donald Rumsfeld was in France some years ago and had to sneak out the back door and run to the airport and flee because France was about to arrest him. In today's New York Times, officials in Israel admitted that they are afraid to travel to England and other countries in Europe because they don't want to be seized and arrested and prosecuted for war crimes. And by the way, Israel uses universal jurisdiction. Israel has prosecuted Nazis for crimes that had nothing to do with Israel. The United States has prosecuted Africans for crimes committed in Africa that had nothing to do with the United States. Universal jurisdiction is, is acceptable, except when Spain tries to use it against us, or anybody tries to use it against us. Then it's an outrage. So we can sit back and wait for the rest of the world to prosecute our criminals. Or we can pressure the Department of Justice to expand this prosecution that as is would be worse than nothing. We can push for local and state prosecutions. We can pass local resolutions. We can get the city council in St. Petersburg to pass an ordinance like they've done in a bunch of cities in Vermont. Is that these people set foot here? We're arresting them. We can, we can pursue 
civil suits. There have been rulings within the past month that said John Ashcroft and John Yu can be pursued for, for damages by their victims for crimes for which they have not been indicted. Uh, we can pursue the International Criminal Court. But, you know, none of these people represent us. We don't have real power over any of these people. But we are supposed to have power over Congress. And there are things that Congress could be doing and that we could very easily be forcing Congress to be doing if we get out of our chairs and do it. And Congress doesn't just have all those powers in Article 1, Section 8. Congress has a couple of key ways that it checks the abuses of the other branches, or at least it used to. One of them is a power that is the very first thing given to the House of Representatives, mentioned six times in the Constitution, described in more detail than anything else. Anybody have a guess? Impeachment. Impeachment. And we have arrived at a point where we don't impeach members of the executive branch or former members of the executive branch. We just impeach the judge in Texas for groping women. Right? If, if it's a liberal, if there's sex involved, we can have impeachment. Right? We have impeachment for sex all over the country. Governors, former presidents, you know. But when it comes to things like war and torture and spying and political prosecutions and assassinations, we don't have impeachment. There's a guy named Jay Bybee, whose name is at the bottom of the worst of the worst of these memos, who signed these memos so that Bush would nominate him to be a judge. And now he's a judge for life, out on the West Coast, enjoying himself, ruling, potentially, overruling the work of honest judges on crimes of his former cronies in the Bush Cheney crime syndicate. His crimes of legalizing illegal war and legalizing illegal torture are down in black and white. And you know what they'll tell you if you go and ask on Capitol Hill why he can't be impeached. Fox News would not like it. We would be accused of going after a conservative judge. Never mind, they didn't legalize torture. No. Conservative judge. Can't do it. Can't do it. The other power that Congress has, well, the, the other power that Congress uses to check the abuses of the other two branches. Anybody want to guess this one? It's called subpoena. And during the last Congress, there were dozens of subpoenas left hanging. Dick Cheney was subpoenaed, said, I don't want to show up. Condoleezza Rice was subpoenaed, I'm not inclined, I've got to go shopping for shoes that day. You no, know, you understand. And that's that. They're subpoenaed, they don't show up in the story. And Congress asks the Justice Department to hold them in contempt. And the Justice Department says, what are you kidding? And Congress sues the Justice Department and takes it to court, because then they can drag it out longer and longer and longer. And these people are not re-subpoenaed in the new Congress. They have yet to show up and comply with their subpoenas. The new White House counsel, Greg Craig, friend of Karl Rose, negotiates with the new House Judiciary Committee. And Karl Rose negotiates between the first branch of our government and a common thought, or a Fox News pundit, if that's not enough. And gets partial compliance with a subpoena. And everybody else is just let, let off the hook. And in April, these torture memos come out, and Senator Leahy at the Senate Judiciary Committee says, Judge Leahy, would it inconvenience you any to come in and talk to the United States? Now, I understand if you can't, but would you mind coming in? It's the, it's the Senate, after all, you heard of us. And, and Bybee says, uh, no, no, I've got to go off that day. Sorry. Take it easy. And that's that. And Senator Leahy is terrified. They are, they are literally scared to enforce their own subpoenas because any committee has the undisputed power to send the Capitol Police Force to literally hold in contempt in a jail on Capitol Hill anybody who does not testify to the satisfaction of that committee. And that means more than, I do not recall, sir, 
I do not recall, sir. <coughs> but they're terrified to do it. And they won't do it through the Justice Department because they know the new Justice Department won't enforce their subpoenas any more than the old one. And they won't do it themselves. Right? We, the bunch of, of constituents asked the Congresswoman a year or two ago, Zoe Lofgren, uh, would, she, would she enforce a subpoena herself? That is a process called inherent contempt, which is to say Congress inherently has the power to hold someone in contempt. And she said, can't do it. Can't do it. The sergeant at arms is, is 65 years old. He's got a bad back. Uh, and we shut down that old jail cell that we used to have. You know, like to help you out. Can't do it. I, I have uh, been put in jail cells quite a few times by the Capitol Police Force myself. It's not one guy who's 65. They have an entire police force. They have beehives of jail cells all across Capitol Hill. And these Congress members, some of them truly are remarkably ignorant, but most of them are lying to because they're afraid to do it. So, if you want to get at your Congress member, find out where they're going to be and talk to them face to face. It's very, very powerful. And get a meeting with them and a group of, of your friends and neighbors and talk to them. And if they don't agree to do what the majority of their constituents want, flood them with emails and faxes and, and protests and go after them in the local media and make your own media. And if they still won't do what you want, go to their office and sit there and do not leave. And if you're sitting there for health care, cough a lot. I mean, get informed, know your legal rights, know if they're treating it as a federal building and what the charges are. Be prepared if you want to take a course in how not to be provoked to slap somebody, you know. But I've never had any training. It's never been hard. It's never been frightening. It's never been difficult. It's actually enjoyable. Uh, and it can be effective. And if you can shut down these people's offices and the streets between their homes and their offices, and their offices in Washington, D.C. make their phone ring all day long, make it harder for them to ignore you than to ignore the leaders of their party or Fox News or the people who fund their campaigns. And so my, my brief proposals for when you go to your Congress member would be this. First, ask them if they will introduce a one-sentence bill that says, the House Judiciary Committee shall consider whether J. Bybee has committed impeachable offenses. Does anybody remember Alberto Gonzalez? Anybody remember why he fled and quit? He had a nice cushy job as Attorney General and he quit and left. Anybody remember why? There was a congressman from Washington State who introduced a one-sentence bill that said the House Judiciary Committee shall investigate whether Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez has committed impeachable offenses. And, co and, and Congress members started signing on as co-sponsors. And it was summer break, and dozens more signing on. And before they came back in the fall, he quits and leaves. And in fact, of the many, many times that impeachments have been attempted in our country, most times they get what you're after far short of having to actually get an impeachment. Because it, it's the threat of something with teeth to it. If you have an impeachment here, and if you bring in Alberto Gonzalez or you bring in Jay Bybee, they can't refuse. They have to testify, and they have to produce anything you ask for, and the White House has to produce anything you ask for. And they cannot say executive privilege. You can't say those words, because it's an impeachment hearing. And when Richard Nixon said, eh, not going to give you that stuff, executive privilege, national security, they said, there's another impeachable offense. Put that one on the list. Failing to comply with an impeachment hearing. That is what Nixon was almost impeached for, and that's why he left town. So you've got a congressman named Alan Grayson who's willing to say some bad things about Republicans, and he's flooded with money and support. I guarantee you that the congressman or congresswoman who puts in an, a, a statement, a one-sentence bill on Jay Bybee, 
becomes an international hero. And Alan Grayson starts asking them for money. Um, and you have a restoration of Congress. I, I would say, secondly, you get them to commit that they will vote no on any bill that funds an escalation in Afghanistan. Right? And Alan Grayson was the only Flor Floridian who voted no on more money in June. So he might do it. Um, you know, you, you don't care what's in their hearts or whether they like you or whether they're with you or whether they'll have dinner with you. You care whether they'll commit to something that you can go back and say, did they do it, yes or no? That's what you want. And I, third, I would say, get them to commit that they will vote no on any health care bill that doesn't, at the very least, have a very serious, major, immediate, public, public option. And only Congressman Wexler from Florida has done that. Um, and, and, and I would say, you know, it looks impossible. These people don't care. They won't meet with you. They'll, they'll threaten to ruin your lives and get you thrown out of school. And it's just too much work and it's impossible and we're not winning anything and everything is hopeless. But it, it was us who threw Alberto Gonzalez out of town. A few weeks ago, a bunch of friends of mine went and protested for about a fifth time a shopping mall in Philadelphia where the U.S. Army had installed a video arcade for killing with real tanks and real weapons and video screens for 13-year-olds to learn how much fun it is to kill Muslims. And the Army has now decided the prototype's not working so well, they're probably not going to put those in shopping malls across the country because people went and protested. A couple weeks ago, well, a few weeks ago now, the president announced that out of the goodness of his heart, he's not going to put a so-called military uh, missile defense radar base in the Czech Republic. There was five people in the Czech Republic who said, we don't want this here, and organized and advertised and went on hunger strikes and passed local resolutions and got 130 mayors, took them to the Capitol, passed a bill, overthrew a government, and had the whole nation say, hell no, and he couldn't have put that base there if he wanted to. A friend of mine, who's an Iraq veteran, went to Japan recently, talked to the brand new government in Japan, where they're actually listening to people because the people actually just threw out a bunch of their colleagues. And on the way home comes the report that the, that the government in Japan agreed to what they were asking for and is going to get out and stop supporting in any way the war in Afghanistan. We when uh, Melissa was up here, she was talking about the after Downing Street campaign and the, and the evidence that we were lied into a war in Iraq. You know, they have been trying with very similar lies to take us into Iran for years. And there's not going to be a day when they announce you did it, you won, you stopped an attack on Iran. But we've done that every day for the past several years. Go look at the cover of Newsweek this week. Nuclear explosion after Iran gets the bomb. Everybody be scared. And nobody's being scared. Everybody's wised up. We're winning that one. And you look at the polls of the American public. You read chapter 22, and you're like, look, we are much smarter, much wiser, much more progressive, much kinder, much more sophisticated than our televisions or our newspapers will ever let you know. We are a majority on most issues we have anything to do with, and we think we're a little minority. And we've turned this country against wars. So when people ask me, isn't it hard? How are we going to succeed? Isn't it too much work? One answer I give is, you know, there are a lot more successes if you look for them and you talk to people, and there are successes at the state and local levels, and if you need that kind of encouragement, it's there, but it's not on TV. But why do you need it? Why do you need it? Shouldn't we work hardest when things look most hopeless? Why does success have to be just over the ridge for us to get involved and work for it? Didn't people work for generations to end slavery and give us workers' rights and give women the right to vote? Didn't people work their lives and die and not see it and yet make it happen? And isn't that what you have 
a moral responsibility to do, regardless of whether you think we're going to win tomorrow or we're going to win in a hundred years. So I, I want to close by reading two quotes uh, that I put at the front of this book uh, from two very different people in two different languages and different words saying the exact same thing. This is I.F. Stone. The only kinds of fights worth fighting are those who are going to lose because somebody has to fight them and lose and lose and lose until someday somebody who believes as you do wins. In order for somebody to win an important major fight a hundred years hence, a lot of other people have got to be willing for the sheer fun and joy of it to go right in and fight knowing you're going to lose. You mustn't feel like a martyr. You've got to enjoy it. And this is Albert Camus. This is, this is the end of an essay that I recommend reading the whole thing about a guy named Sisyphus who rolls rocks up hills. And it says, I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches a higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. The universe henceforth without a master seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain in itself forms a world. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. Thank you. Do you have any questions?